Good evening and thank you all for being here. I'm Rod Voss. I'm the director of Liturgy and Music here at Transfiguration. I've been here since 1992. Prior to that, I was at several other Catholic churches. This one just fit my personality the best. That's why I've managed to stay here for over 25 years. The other churches, not so much. Many of you already know me, but you may not know the nickname that I have from some of our priests and deacons. That would be the angel of death. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I have to notify them and harass them every time we are coordinating a funeral. For decades, I've been helping families with funeral arrangements and planning funeral masses or liturgies. I developed the form that I think you all have, um, mainly just to keep everything, all the details in one place, and also to have a checklist to make sure that we touch bases on all of the different items that come up in dealing with a funeral. The first part of my talk tonight will be going over the mechanics of organizing a funeral, and I'll be encouraging you to have some of the planning done in advance for your own funeral. The reason for that is that pre-planning is a blessing for your loved ones. It frees them up for making hard decisions when they're in the midst of grief and emotional turmoil. It just makes more sense to have your wishes in place um, and it will, they will thank you for it. The second part of my talk will touch on the challenge of preparing ourselves for our own death. It's not like any of us are going to get out of this alive. And so many people try to ignore it and hope it will go away, but I don't believe that's the best course of action. So on this administrative form, um, Obviously, the name of the deceased right off the bat. Birth dates and birth death, and those we can, um, we can find in our records, but we have had situations where we have Catholic parishioners whose next door neighbor was never involved in a parish. And we do get calls from them, and they feel like they have to come begging, but you don't have to beg. We have done funerals for many different people who are not parishioners, and actually quite a few for those who are not Catholic. In that case, we do a simple liturgy of the word. Um, we don't discriminate in that regard. Um, the first thing that you're going to deal with, though, when there is a death in the family is choosing an undertaker, choosing a funeral home. Um, I really advise you to think of that ahead of time. I have gone to the hospital to be with people as their loved one is passing, if I get word of that. And they pass, and they literally hadn't even thought that the next thing they have to do is have someone take care of their loved one. So please give that some thought. Um, if you have concerns about who to use, uh, we can give you some advice in that regard, depending on what services you're looking for. You'll notice the next section is broken up into a wake service, a funeral, and the burial. The reason we have the wake service is not simply for something to do the night before the funeral. Um, most people do visitation at that time but a wake service is really about looking backwards on the person's life and reflecting on how they had an impact on you and sharing stories, and if you're Irish, doing a few other things. <laughs> um, you'll note that um, there's a presider opening. I usually, when I get a call, that we've had a death, I will be asking you if you have 
a deacon preference if you have a priest preference. Sometimes people do, sometimes they don't. But we will honor your wishes as, as best we can. So the wake is all about looking backwards. A funeral mass is all about looking forward. I shouldn't say all because we can't get by with that. It's technically supposed to be a mini Easter celebrating resurrection and new life. However, grief does not up and vanish um, overnight and a lot of people aren't ready to move that far. Although, I do try to encourage people to incorporate at least a couple elements of um, the resurrection theme. Um, that's why we gather as Christians and have our funeral liturgies. Don't be too confused about the technicalities at the bottom of the funeral. It just indicates a mass, which is most typical a memorial mass is when either the body or the cremains cannot be present. In that case, it is technically a memorial mass. That's the difference. A lot of you think of a memorial mass as something that's a month later or a year later and you're doing a memorial of their passing. But at the, at the moment of death, um, if for whatever reasons we cannot have either a casket or cremains, then it is a memorial mass and some of the ritual changes. We try, we do more than try, we do honor the body that is present in whatever form it is. It's uh, not a concern whether it's a casket or cremains. If you are from an era where you're still going, you know, I'm not comfortable with being Catholic and having cremains, I have some Catholic updates on the piano over here that go into that <laughs> subject entirely, if you want to be more at peace with a choice. Um, Liturgy of the Word, again, is just for typically non-Catholics, and that is just basically the first half of a Mass, all about the readings and a homily and prayers, and, and that's all that that service is. You will be asked about burial, and I must tell you that the Catholic Church strongly, some priests very firmly, <laughs> recommend that you bury the remains. Those of you that know me know that I've always had a well, I was going to say love-hate relationship with rules. I'm just, <laughs> just, a, yeah. Just because it's a rule doesn't mean you should follow it. However, what I've read, what I've read about dealing with grief from some very well-known counselors, but also chatting with people in this area that are counselors, they say that... Um, they typically have two types of grief cases that are ongoing, that they can't resolve relatively easily. And it's when they keep the cremains in the house, on the mantle, they can't, they can't get past that first step of grief. And they also have cases where people have scattered the ashes somewhere and they come still in grief saying, I wish there was just a place I could go and be with them. So yes, it's a church rule, but I think anthropologically as humans, there's just something in us that we are more comfortable having that distance for now, but still having a place to be with them, um, something to consider. The reason that we list um, nearest relative and other relatives, this doesn't go in a program. It's simply there for me. If I'm, some weeks I've got three or four funerals all at the same time or three or four deaths I'm juggling. 
and I get a phone call, and it's really nice to know which family member belongs with which deceased. It saves us a lot of panic. Um, it's also there for the priests and deacon, so that when they meet the family group, especially some families are pretty good sized, um, they're not just scrambling trying to grab names out of the air. Um, they can be a little bit prepared. Most of you, I believe, know that we broadcast our weekend masses on the internet. It will always be a choice for you with funerals, whether you wish to do that with a funeral. Again, it only appears on our website. It's not like it's out in YouTube space where anybody can just grab it. Um, the funeral that we did last week had 100 people log in to watch the funeral. So it is more effective for some families. These days, it's so hard to get off work, and you end up taking at least a half a day, considering how long it takes to drive around the metro area. Um, we're finding that people are leaning more and more to using that internet access. Another piece of the puzzle, just on the administrative side, is giving you the opportunity to have as many flowers or memorabilia as you wish. The undertakers will always tell you, well, you can have two arrangements. They seem to say that that's what happens at every church, but I've been here over 25 years, and that has never been a rule here, and we take all of them. I think they're just hoping they don't have to get a van and load everything up <laughs> and drag it over here. But that is your prerogative, and yes, they will do it when directed. And I won't back them up on their two bouquet policy. Um, and as far as memorabilia, some people, um, some people have unique things that are just so near and dear to the deceased that it's nice to have it present there for the funeral too. That's certainly not necessary, but you can bet your bottom dollar that my Alan Page signed Vikings jersey <laughs> will be there. <laughs> Diehard Vikings fan here. One more year of futility coming up. Um, the flip side of the form is the funeral planning. And while I usually don't encourage it, because it comes under one of the thou shalt nots, but I strongly recommend that you steal weekend programs if we do a tune that strikes you as something that you would want or that you would like. Grab the program, but do us a real favor. If you haven't filled out this form, but you just have the programs, circle the song you like. I have had family planning sessions, and they come in oh, with a half a dozen or more programs. None of them are marked. I'm supposed to go psychic to figure out <laughs> what song from each program was what, what they hoped for. Um, glancing down the form, you'll see there's an opening song, the psalm response, the preparation of the gift song, communion songs a recessional song, you got a lot of things to pick at. And you don't have to fill all of those slots. I encourage people to get these at least somewhat jotted in with anything you do want. You don't necessarily have to cover all the bases, but fill in what you do want and give us a copy. I keep files of everybody that's got a pre-plan. And yes, people after 10 years or so come in and go, you know, my favorites have changed, so we yank out the old form and they get a fresh form in. The, um, the very top line, the placing of the pall or the carrying of the urn, I think a lot of you present have attended funerals here, but we begin at the baptismal font as a remembrance of our baptismal promise. We're baptized into Christ's death, so are we baptized into his resurrection. So that's why the family gathers there with either the cremains or the casket. 
and go through the baptismal remembrance, and then the gathering song starts, and everyone walks forward around to the front of the altar. If it's a casket, the undertakers will wheel it. We don't use pallbearers inside. Everything is automated, for lack of a better term. Um, but if it's Tremaine, someone will need to carry those in. And as we talk about people to involve in the funeral, be aware that I will let them know if they have a last minute grief attack and gut clench and just can't do it, there are people standing in the wings ready to leap in and, um, and keep things going. So there's no, and their name doesn't go in the program, so there's no stress to them that they're sitting there sobbing instead of doing the first reading. Everybody isn't going to be staring at them wondering why they're not up there. So um, this white sheet that you also possibly grabbed is, I think, a very good idea just to peruse all of these. These are suggestions from the USCCB, the United States Council of Catholic Bishops, and is in the official funeral book. You'll notice there's only seven of the Old Testament options at the very top. That seems a little strange considering how chubby the Old Testament is compared to the New Testament. However, before Jesus got here, they did have inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but not a clear demonstration. That's why the next section, the New Testament, has 19 options to choose from. And as in the Easter season, during the Easter season, I don't know if you've noticed, but at the Sunday readings, we have two New Testament readings. We don't do an old and a new during the Easter season. So for a funeral, which is a mini Easter, it's appropriate to just use two New Testament readings if you wish. The Gospel readings, um, we will always take your suggestions, but the priest has got to put together a homily, and if they know the person and they feel strongly that a certain gospel will help them tie everything together, they reserve the right to choose the gospel. But nine times out of 10, when a family suggests one, they'll go with it, they'll go with it. Um, some of these blanks on your mass form, you don't have to worry about. Some of those are for uh, our office, because we put together a special program, and um, we need to know which Alleluia to use, which Holy, um, which Lamb of God. Those are things that change seasonally here, and you don't necessarily have to have the ones that we're doing when you pass. There are some people that share their opinions pretty freely and absolutely loathe some of the acclamations that we're doing and go, please God, not that one. Fine. If you have a favorite, hallelujah, favorite holies, keep the program so we know how to backtrack that and, um, and get that used. And the other thing that is a preset is the song of farewell. For quite a while now, I can't seem to shake it, we have been doing the Howard Hughes version of May the Angels Lead You Into Paradise. And that is while we are incensing the casket or cremains at the very end of the Mass. And that is to show respect to their body that housed the Holy Spirit in this life. And following up with a recessional. The only other thing you should keep in mind is personnel. You'll notice under the first and second reading there's a lector blank. So you can give some thought to people that you would like to read at your funeral. There are also gift bearers to be chosen. People always say, how many? Uh, my standard response is, 
2 and less than 20. <laughs> but that's because sometimes they choose to use all of the grandchildren. And you don't, and you do want to, it depends on the ages, but a lot of times they want to have them feel like they're a part of something. And that's something they can do. We just create an entourage. The two in front carry the bread and the wine, and everyone else is just behind them. But they get to have a part in grandpa's funeral or whomever. And then communion ministers, Eucharistic ministers, um, you can't just randomly pick those. <laughs> I wish you could, but you can't. Um, but if you have friends here or relatives that are Eucharistic ministers, by all means, jot those down. And I usually encourage people to jot them in order of your preference, who you really want to make sure they do, and then the next person, yes, but then after that. The reason for that is we don't know how big the crowd's going to be. We don't know how many Eucharistic ministers we're going to need. Certainly not as many as Sunday, unless it's one of the biggest funerals I've ever seen. I guess those have happened too. But um, you'll need a few of those. And basically, that's your form. We can talk about questions with that later. I also have to just impress on you that when you have a death, it is really important that you contact us as quickly as possible. If I know that a family member is failing and it is eminent, I will give you my cell number and tell you to call it 24 hours a day. I turn it off when I'm sleeping, but at least I'll get the message the first moment, the first next moment that I'm conscious. And um, what I have to do is try to coordinate with your needs of when the family would like to have a funeral with the church schedule to see if that's available, then a priest preference and see if they're cooperating with that time slot, double check with the funeral home to make sure they don't have four going at the same time. Um, but yeah, basically I just run in circles with priests and deacons and um, that's why when I call them at odd hours, that's when I get the, oh no, are you the angel of death again? <laughs> and they just know it's, it's coming. Um, but we'll do our best to, to uh, coordinate. We have had families go ahead and schedule a funeral here and put it on social media and then notify us when we're, we're doing it. And I'm like, well, the church isn't available. What do you mean it isn't? I mean, it's already booked prior. Um, so it's really dangerous to just jump in and decide something ahead of time. I've got to triple check all, of the, all the way around the horn, and that'll keep it going much more smoothly. The other extreme was a woman, June. I miss June Steele. She was a character that was totally at peace with dying. She did it gracefully. Well, it wasn't as graceful when they put a mop on her head. It was the kind that drapes way down. She looked like a Raggedy Ann doll, but she did it as a gag. Um, she was joyful to be going home to the Lord, but she was also, I won't say crazy, but certainly eccentric. She insisted that it had to be on a Saturday in church, Bishop Hall had to be available afterwards, which is also a roll of the dice. Monsignor had to be available, and I had to do the music. It was six weeks later when all of those stars aligned. <laughs> and she was firm that she didn't care if it took six months. She had to have that arrangement. So that can be accommodated, too. Um, probably wouldn't be my first choice as a family member. It's a little tough after a death until the funeral. Um, and putting it out six weeks or months, I think, is a little hard, hard on the family. Um, 
the, um, the clergy here are available. Um, a lot of times some people are hesitant to call and say, please come now. Um, but I have seen these vicars and literally running, <laughs> running out the door and I'm yelling, do you know where you're going? And he's like, not yet, but by the time I get to my car as he's using his phone um, to get the address. We do, and they are available to visit with family members about grief. Um, I've been doing that for decades also um, because when Father Pat was here the early days, he was the only priest and he couldn't be everywhere at all times. So unfortunately, I think it's unfortunately, we started that habit. Um, I was hoping that Father Fernando would give me a break on that, but that didn't work out so well. He sat in on my first two family sessions and he went, you just keep going, you're fine. So I hope that's not disturbing for some family members. They do prefer to see a Roman collar. Um, and yeah, I'll put this on tape. Uh, people have occasionally asked why I didn't ever get ordained a deacon or something, and my usual response is, if I put on a Roman collar, my head would explode. <laughs> they just, they have that little thing called a vow of obedience, and that's just never been my long suit. Um, I was still raising heck with Monsignor at the 5 o'clock Mass on this past Saturday. I can't help myself. It's compulsive and no, it's not going to change anytime soon unless I get fired. I don't know. We'll see how that goes. Um, I will swing back again to this form at the end if you wish to have questions answered. But right now, I'm going to segue into the second half. And that's dealing with all of our impending death. Um, it's not a popular subject to discuss, and it seems like people would always like to change the subject and talk about something else. They'll acknowledge that somebody passed, and then how about those braves? Um, <laughs> but I, when I was putting this part together, I was reminded of a story of a young child saying their prayers before bedtime, and it went something like this. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die, let it be peacefully in my sleep like Grandpa, not screaming like the people that were in the back seat of the car he was driving at the time. <laughs> I know. I deal with death all the time. I have to have a release valve occasionally. Um, <coughs> And yeah, we can kind of laugh about death, but there's still part of us that it's probably sometimes nervous laughter, uh, more than genuine. I, um, like I said, I've gone to hospice centers, I've gone to hospitals, and I've witnessed what I consider too many people um, looking at death with despair, feeling like it's a thief that's stealing their life, that it's so unfair. And I believe that comes from having a perspective that we are physical creatures that are always hoping and longing for an occasional spiritual experience. And hoping that that spiritual experience will comfort and strengthen their belief in the afterlife. Many of us attend church throughout our lives and we listen to stories in scripture where Jesus is born, teaches and heals, dies and rises and promises us the same. And we want to firmly believe it, but there tend to be shadows of doubts that crop up, especially when we're nearer taking our own last breath. We're so obsessed with our physical nature that we forget where we came from. As I've grown older, 
I'm more comfortable turning the notion of being a physical creature upside down. I believe at our deepest, truest selves, we're actually spiritual beings having a physical experience. This body is a vehicle that allows us to interact and communicate with each other on this earthly plane, but it eventually becomes a husk that will be discarded while our spiritual being remains. I don't mean to demean the value of our bodies or the care that we give them. Psalm 139 speaks to us as being known by God before we're born and that we're being knitted in our mother's womb and that God was present in that place in that time. The part that always worried me was that it also goes on to say that God saw all of our days before we'd even lived one. Um, I shared that concern or just feel of disturbance <laughs> with a spiritual director, and his response was, you should take solace in that because if God didn't like the way these days looked, you would have been snuffed out of existence before you even started. So <laughs> it was trying to see it as a comfort. If I'm here, he saw that something good could come of it. Um, so I'd like you, I just ask that you consider that our spiritual nature has an even greater value than our, phys our physical nature. Um, another one of my favorite psalms is 90, um, and that's been paraphrased by Bernadette Farrell in a song, and I, I plan on using this at my funeral, and no, the choir has not sung it before, and I told them there's no rush to learn it. <laughs> um, but that eventually, it will be my wish. But a paraphrase of Psalm 90. Restless is the heart until it comes to rest in you. All the earth shall remember and return to our God. Lord, you have been our refuge through all time, from one generation to the next. Before the mountains were born, or the earth was brought forth, you are God without beginning or end. To your eyes, a thousand years are like a day, no more than a watch in the night. You sweep us away like a dream, like the grass that springs green in the morning, but faded by night. Make us know our life's shortness, that we may gain true wisdom of heart. In the morning, fill us with your love. Restless is the heart until it comes to rest in you. All the earth, shall remember and return to our God. So this notion of returning to God rather than meeting face to face for the first time at our earthly death, it puts a different spin on the anticipation. And so when our body wears out and fails, we're returning home rather than leaping into a great unknown. I don't know if that's something you can accept, but I can maybe recommend some other books that can reinforce that concept. But it does. I, um, my dad died in November, and I spent a week with him before he died. And yeah, he'd had congestive heart failure, so it was long and slow. It's like, oh, six months of suspense going, when's it going to happen? When's it going to happen? But that's why I spent his last week 
with him. I didn't let him, but he actually did beat me in backgammon the last time. And my family reputation is I'm supposed to be unbeatable, but God saw fit that his last backgammon game he won. But to encourage him, while we, I think we struggle to know God or question whether we know God well enough, I don't know that that's the question. Um, I think the real one is that we can relax that God knows us intimately well. And while we have confusions and doubts, uh, God not so much. And I firmly believe that we are gathered gently upon death. And um, like I said, in the psalm, God's numbered all of our days already. Can see what they are. So it's not like he's going to be on vacation when you pass. He knows when you're coming. So I'm not, I wasn't sure if I was going to share this story, but I, I'll take a leap of faith here. I had a choir member come to me, and he was very concerned about his three-year-old son. He, he was worried about the kid's mental health um, and very disturbed. What happened was they were, he and his wife were going to bed and they heard, he heard his son crying in his bedroom. He'd been put to bed quite a bit earlier. So he went in and said, honey, what's the matter? And in between sobs, this three-year-old boy said, I miss God. And Reggie was like, what? <laughs> and he said, I miss God. I used to be with God. And I want to be with God again. I miss, it was wonderful being with God. I want to be with God. And Reggie, trying to comfort him, said, well, that's fine, honey. When you die, you'll be with God. Well, that set him off sobbing even louder. <laughs> I don't want to die. I just want to be with God. And so he was, again, very concerned what's going on in this child's head. But I truly believe three-year-olds still have a connection that the rest of us can only hope for. There's a lot to be said for innocence. Um, and there's a lot to be said for being fresh in this world. I do think there's something going on there that we can't even perceive, but very few of us can even turn down an infant, an infant animal. They're all adorable to us. Well, not snakes, but anyway. Um, <laughs> but with children, they are special. And I think that's why Jesus said, let the children come to me, because it's such as these, because they can see and feel more clearly. We get caught up in all of this physicality of this world, and we're worried about paying bills, and we're worried about, well, some of us, um, wrinkles, whatever. Um, we have issues that distract us from union with God. And so I encouraged him to read Psalm 139. It's like, was he with God? Yes, in his mother's womb, God was there. And he may have still had some recollection of how wonderful that felt. I don't know. But I tried to discourage him from taking him immediately to mental health care. I thought that was a little extreme. Um, I'm just going to read a couple quotes, and then we're going to wrap up for the night. This one is from one of my favorites, St. Francis. I don't know if you've read his biography, but it gives me hope. Before becoming a saint, he was a wild man, so I, it keeps giving me hope for myself. We'll see. But St. Francis, keep a clear eye toward life's end. Do not forget your purpose and destiny as God's creature. What you are in his sight is what you are and nothing more. Remember that when you leave this earth, you can take nothing that you have received. 
but only what you have given. A full heart, enriched by honest service, love, sacrifice, and courage. And I had not run across that quote until I was research, researching doing this evening. And I honestly had never thought of it that way, just that we, obviously, we make jokes about having a Brinks car being pulled behind the hearse. Um, that doesn't work so well. But that we actually um, take with us what we've given to others in this life. That, for some reason, has escaped me for 60-some years, and I finally caught up with that one. I'm glad I did. And because, oh, I'm going to get in trouble. Because women, it's just better if they get the last word. Um, this next quote, I know, sorry, Kathy. Uh, this next quote comes from St. Clair, his sister, on her deathbed, speaking about herself. Go forth in peace, for you have followed the good road. Go forth without fear, for he has created you and has sanctified you and has always protected you and loves you as a mother. Blessed are you, O oh God, for having created me. And God bless you all for being here this evening and I will be available for questions very shortly, and I hope you have a wonderful week. And I hope the rain stops so we can not be soaked when we get to our cars. Take care. <laughs>